Welcome back to English for Philosophy Students. Glad to have you back. Um, this week we had a few questions, but I answered them directly by email. Uh, there were none that were very general. So we will go straight into the book today. And I want to tell you that if you would like to ask any question at all about American life, about anything at all, um, you can send it in Portuguese or in English. And we'll collect them over the week and uh, discuss what you would like to discuss. So I invite you to send some questions. But for this week, we're going to go directly back to the book. So let's see. We were on page 25 at the top of the page. Let's see. What were we talking about? All right. Okay. Um, leave us was saying that one indication of the huge change that had come upon the educational environment was the explosion of manufacture of books. In the past, Students had a few classical books to read and discuss and study. But in a few years' time, everything changed and large publishing houses were founded to produce large amounts of educational books. And these books were written by English professors who apparently knew nothing whatsoever about the nature of literature or about the needs of the typical students of literature. The books became part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Also, the sheer number of books was an indication of an enormous change. Instead of having a few students who were well prepared intellectually, the cream of the crop, now we have tons of students. Everybody is in college. They are not prepared and um, real scholarship is no longer happening. So we move on to the first paragraph on page 25. <clears throat> I'll read the paragraph. What, when I recall the old project, alone can seem worthwhile at the moment of history characterized by this industrial avalanche is the clear, challenging, and comprehensive manifesto, the most telling presentment one can achieve of a complex totality, a presentment um, referable to as the idea, though idea hardly suggests strongly enough the concreteness of the evocation I have in mind as the necessary kind of argument, the unsettling representation of facts and basic human needs that determines judgment positively. When I was preparing to teach this class, this paragraph was very difficult for me. I found it unintelligible. 
I couldn't understand it at all. So we must take it apart bit by bit in order to understand what Levis is saying. So the first sentence, the skeleton of the sentence, the core of the sentence is this. What seems worthwhile is the manifesto. Okay, that's the core. What seems worthwhile is the manifesto. Okay, this is the core of the first half of the sentence, I think. Yeah, the core of the first major portion of the sentence. What seems worthwhile is the subject. Now, worthwhile means valuable. Valuable. What seems valuable? So, basically, the meaning is this. The manifesto is valuable. What is a manifesto? I looked it up to be sure myself. A manifesto is a public declaration of your intentions. I'll write that down. It's a public declaration of one's intentions. Um, public means for all the world to hear and see. Open, not clandestine, as we learned last week. Clandestine means secret. Levis is not saying we want a secret declaration to only those who agree with us, an underground movement. No. He says we need a public declaration of our intentions. Okay, that's what a manifesto is. So, what seems valuable is a public declaration of what's intention, one's intentions. Now, he inserts something here. Okay, I'll read it. What, when I recall the old project, alone can seem worthwhile. Okay. What, when I remember the old project, alone can seem worthwhile. Okay, when I remember the old project, what is the old project? The old project was the book about practical criticism 
or the book about judgment and analysis. So it's going to be the book that he never wrote. The book he didn't write. And remember, he is still talking about why didn't he finish his book. He's been talking about that from the first page. Why didn't I write this book? Well, one reason is because things have changed. And the book no longer seemed relevant or important in light of the huge change. Something else now seems worthwhile. What, when I think about the book, alone can seem worthwhile. Alone means only. So remember our core sentence, what seems worthwhile, we should add to it, what is the only thing that seems worthwhile. Only one thing can seem worthwhile when I am thinking about the book I didn't write. That's what Levis is saying. Only one thing is important and relevant now. The book is no longer important and relevant because things have changed. Only one thing one thing is worthwhile. And what is that one thing? The manifesto. Okay, the manifesto is the only thing in light of practical criticism. The manifesto is the only thing that seems worthwhile. So again, what is this manifesto? Let us look at the vocabulary he uses to describe it. It is the clear, challenging, and comprehensive manifesto. Okay, the clear, challenging, and comprehensive manifesto. Remember, a manifesto is a public declaration of one's intention, what one wants to do and accomplish. So, Levis says that instead of writing a book about judgment and analysis for students, he was going to write a book to the world, a manifesto. Um, and that manifesto would be clear, hopefully, even though it's very difficult to explain what he is seeing. He wants it to be clear. He wants it to be challenging so that the sleepy people in education who are allowing education to just slip away without even noticing will be shaken up. And comprehensive means it's got to explain everything. It will be broad in scope. It will not miss anything. So he says, instead of writing a book telling about how to do judgment and analysis, I need to write a huge manifesto explaining what all the problems are, explaining why we need to study, explaining how knowledge of literature contributes to thought and the development of thought and how, <clears throat> excuse me, how literary education is foundational. It's a distinctive discipline. It is in a category by itself. In other words, this book, this introduction that we are reading is more what he needed to write. It was the thing that would um, be valuable in the situation in which he found himself. So let us read uh, the sentence one more time. 
What, when I recall the old project, alone can seem worthwhile at the moment of history, characterized by this industrial avalanche. I didn't explain that phrase. The moment of history. Now, Levis feels that he is at a turning point of history, a pivotal time of history. He said previously that the comments of um, the guy, uh, the professor who put out the paper saying get rid of practical criticism, th that guy's ignorance was a moment of history, uh, historical in itself. So Levis feels this is a pivotal moment of history, and he says this moment of history is characterized by an industrial avalanche. An avalanche is when the rocks come tumbling down, or the snow and ice all falls down. An industrial avalanche of, uh, I think it's of books, right? I think it means the book industry is now piling us with more and more books. People are being smothered and suffocated. At this point in history, what we need is a clear, challenging, and comprehensive manifesto. Um, and what will the manifesto say? We will read on. It will be the most telling presentment one can achieve of a complex totality. A presentment referable to as the idea, though idea hardly suggests strongly enough the concreteness of the evocation I have in mind as the necessary kind of argument. I'm going to stop there. It just goes on. This is a very long sentence. So let's get this portion and then we'll get the very end. The most telling presentment. Telling. It does not just mean to tell, like I tell you my name. It does not mean that. It does not mean to communicate something. Telling means to, um, for instance, we have a phrase, he struck a telling blow. Uh, a telling blow would be a very strong impact, um, usually decisive. He won the argument with a telling response. So telling means striking and strong and arresting and decisive telling. Okay, so the most telling is even one superlative beyond telling. The most telling presentment. Now, presentment means presentation. So, the manifesto will be the most telling, striking, and effective presentation of a complex totality. So it's not just one thing. It is complex. The problems are coming from the philosophies of today. They're coming from the politics of today. They're coming from the mass media. They're coming from the way students are being raised. They're coming from the way the academic environment is moving. Uh, there's a complex uh, totality, but not only of problems, also of the, the living principle, the, the way that human intellect is developed. Okay, so it will be a, the most telling presentment one can achieve of a complex totality. A presentment referable to as the idea. So he wants them to get the idea. And the idea 
means the complex totality of everything Levis is trying to say. He just says, I need them to get the idea. Although the word idea hardly suggests strongly enough the concreteness of the evocation. So concrete, concrete is rock. Concrete is specific. It is not vague. So Levis does not have a vague notion. Levis has a concrete idea that he is trying to evoke. What does evoke mean? Lots of vocabulary. Evoke. This is a small K, sorry. Evoke. Um, <clears throat> if I am describing a scene to you that you have never seen before, maybe I am describing the way it looks in Alaska when the aurora borealis is shining, the northern lights. I don't want just to say, there's snow on the ground, the sky is dark, and there's lights. Okay, we all know that. I want to say it in a way which conjures an image in your mind that ignites your imagination. To evoke is to draw forth from you an idea from your heart. So I want to say words that will lead you to create the image in your own head. So when Levis uses the word, a concrete evocation, he is saying that there is a very specific idea in his mind, but you have to have it come up from your own heart. You have to grasp it and draw it forth. It has to develop in your imagination. He cannot just present it factually in words. He must evoke from your heart. Okay, so that's what he means by evocation. Um, so, the idea hardly suggests strongly enough the concreteness of the evocation I have in mind as the necessary kind of argument. So, Levis feels that he is trying to make an argument. He is trying to convince the world of something. Um, and making the argument involves evoking a complex totality of ideas in the people he is addressing. And the argument he further describes as the unsettling representation of facts and basic human needs that determines judgment positively. Um, so, the evocation of the ideas creates an argument for action. It creates a case for action. And this argument is supposed to unsettle people. People are happy, content, and asleep as the world is slipping away into darkness and ignorance and evil. And yet the professors say, oh, it's good. We have a lot of people in classes, many students, tons of participation. It's all good. No, this argument is supposed to unsettle them. It's supposed to, they're settled, we need to unsettle them. It's supposed to disturb their serenity. Um, so, it's an unsettling representation of facts. Facts about the lowering of the intellectual level of the country. Facts about the rise of... Um, crime and immorality 
and all kinds of bad things on the rise, all kinds of good things going down. These are facts. Um, also, an unsettling representation of basic human needs. Human beings need to be nurtured in their intellect so they can rise to their full potential in the image of God and intellectually and academically. People need intellectual food. They need um, to be taught and nurtured. These are needs. So the manifesto must contain an unsettling representation of the needs of the students which are going unmet. This is a problem. We need to unsettle people by representing these needs. Okay, so this argument, this unsettling representation of facts, of bad going up, good going down, and human needs will determine judgment positively. In other words, it will lead people to decide to support the right cause. So um, determine judgment positively means this argument will convince the hearer to agree that there is a problem and that we must adopt the old ways of uh, developing uh, students so that they can rise up and take their place in the uh, living continuity of the history of thought. Do you have any questions about anything there? Um, if you have any questions, send them in, and we're going to move on. But uh, that's the end of that paragraph. Okay. I'll read the, second, the next part of the second paragraph. There is no simple prescription to offer. Nothing simple to be said. I want to point out that he just finished saying he was going to write a comprehensive manifesto about the complex totality. This is to exhibit and show forth the needs and the problems. So then he goes on to say, there is no simple prescription. A prescription is something a doctor writes for you for medicine to cure your disease. So you have a cold, here's your prescription, take this medicine, you'll be fine. That's simple. A prescription tells you what to do, what action is prescribed. There isn't one. When he writes the manifesto, it is about ideas and goals. Where do we want to go and where do we want to avoid going? But unfortunately, there is no simple prescription of how to answer all the problems. So, there is no simple prescription to offer, nothing simple to be said. Complex problems. My note is perhaps more solemn than Professor Andreski's, but not out of resonance with it or more serious. I quote from his Social Sciences as Sorcery, a book that bears closely on my own concern. Okay, we are about to read a quote from Professor Andreski, I think his name was Stanislaw Andreski. He was a British economist. And, no, I'm sorry. Lord Robbins was the economist, sorry. Andreski was a social scientist 
who wrote a book that was very similar to this about social studies. It was sort of blasting his, um, the professors in his field of social studies who were um, preventing education in the same way that the English professors in, in uh, Levis's college were preventing English education. So, um, when he says, my note is perhaps more solemn than Professor Andreski's, I think he is referring to, in literal terms, it would be a musical note. La, a note. But um, in figurative language, it simply means his um, attitude, his approach is more solemn. Andreski is lighter. However, not out of resonance. So he is saying he is more serious than Andreski, but they are saying the same things, things which are consonant with one another. So both my note is more solemn, not out of resonance, are both taken from music as a, an analogy but used figuratively. Okay, so I quote from his Social Sciences as Sorcery, a book that bears closely on my own concern. To bear closely on his concern means it is um, extremely relevant. It is talking about the same kinds of problems and offering insights which are helpful to Levis, uh, to Levis's own concern. Levis's concern is the state of English education. Um, his concern, what he is worried about, is the development of intelligence in students by means of the study of literature. So Andreski's work in social science is closely related because he is seeing the same problems, although he sees it in one field and Levis sees it in another. Okay, here is the quote from Andreski. I do not envisage that this blast of my trumpet will bring down the walls of pseudoscience, which are manned by too many stout defenders. The slaves of routine who, to use Bertrand Russell's expression, would rather die than think. Mercenary go-getters, docile educational employees, who judge ideas by the status of their propounders, or the woolly-minded lost souls yearning for gurus. Nevertheless, despite the advanced stage of cretinization which our civilization has reached under the impact of the mass media, there are still people about who like to use their brains without the lure of material gain, and it is for them that this book is intended. But if they are in a minority, then how can truth prevail? The answer, which gives some ground for hope, is that people interested in ideas and prepared to think them through and express them regardless of personal disadvantage have always been few. And if knowledge could not advance without a majority on the right side, there would never have been any progress at all, because it is always easier to get into the limelight, as well as to make money, by charlatanry, doctrinarism, psychophancy, and soothing or stirring oratory, than by logical and fearless thinking. No. The reason why human understanding has been able to advance in the past and may do so in the future 
is that true insights are cumulative and retain their value regardless of what happens to their discoverers. Anyway, let us not despair. I find Andreski easier to understand than Levis, myself. His sentence structure is simpler. I do not envisage that this blast of my trumpet will bring down the walls of pseudoscience. What does envisage mean? The word visage is in there. Appearance. Um, I believe I do not envisage means I do not foresee. I do not think it's going to happen. I'm not expecting this blast of my trumpet will bring down the walls of pseudoscience. Um, in order to understand this phrase, you must know something about the story of, of the Battle of Jericho in the Old Testament. Um, in the Battle of Jericho, the uh, children of Israel were attacking the city. And the city had a very thick wall. You could walk several men abreast on this wall. And I believe it has been found archaeologically uh, where, where it was. However, the uh, children of Israel were told by God to not try to attack the city directly, but to send out the soldiers to march around the city one time each day for seven days or six days, and then on the seventh day, march around seven times, singing praises to God. And in the end, after seven times around, they were to blow the trumpets with a tremendous blast and take the city. And what happened was when they blew the trumpets after doing all the walking around, at the blast of the trumpet, the walls fell down. It was a miracle, a great miracle. And the children of Israel flooded in and took the city of Jericho. So if you are familiar with the stories of the Bible, you will understand this phrase. This is a good example of the way literary knowledge is necessary for reading um, because authors frequently allude to other great works of literature that they assume their readers will be familiar with. No footnotes here. You just have to know it. So, so he does not envisage that this blast of his trumpet, in other words, his writing this book, uh, Social Sciences as Sorcery, that's his way of blowing a trumpet, he does not think that will bring down the walls of pseudoscience. Pseudo means fake, not real. Pseudoscience is something which pretends to be scientific, but is not. So he is saying that in his field of the social sciences, you have people who are pretending to be scientific, but really not. And they are in the majority, and they are strong, and to bring them down would be like bringing down the walls of Jericho. So he doesn't think it's going to happen. He thinks his book is not significant enough for that. Okay, so I do not envisage that this blast of my trumpet will bring down the walls of pseudoscience, which are manned by too many stout defenders. Okay, if you man the walls, that means you are guarding them. They had soldiers on top of the wall with weapons, and the walls were manned by many people, and that means attended and guarded by many soldiers. Stout defenders. Stout literally means fat. But in this context, it means strong. So stout usually means fat. 
but in this it means strong, stout warriors, not fat, strong. So the wall is defended by stout warriors on the pseudoscience side of things. Um, and then he goes on to describe these people. They are the slaves of routine. Um, you know what a slave is, someone who must serve under compulsion with no choice. So this is not literal slaves, but slaves of routine. Routine means we do it the same way every day. We make no changes. We do it because it was done before by our fathers or by someone else. So it's a mindless, we just do it and keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. It's a routine. It happens every day. These people are slaves. The defenders of pseudoscience are slaves of routine <coughs> who, to use Bertrand Russell's expression, Bertrand Russell apparently spoke of these people and described them as people who would rather die than think. So he is describing the people in his field as something like zombies or automatons or robots, people who would rather die than think, slaves of routine. Or they might be mercenary go-getters. Mercenary means they are doing it for money in a base way. Usually mercenary, it has a negative connotation of doing for money what you should do for another reason. So, greedy, uh, avaricious, go-getters, people who um, are trying to get. Usually a go-getter is someone who is energetic in pursuit of a, a goal. So mercenary go-getters are energetic in pursuit of a goal for which they are being paid. These are not idealistic people. They don't believe in what they're doing. They're doing it for money. And they're doing it energetically for money. Okay, so these are the people in Andreski's field of social science. Certainly they're not scientists. This isn't the way scientists behave. These are people who have what we call an ax to grind. An ax to grind. They have an axe to grind. That is an idiom for people like this who are doing something in order to get material gain. This comes from a story um, where there was a little boy who was uh, working, unhappily working, for his father um, at the whetstone. It's a uh, a round rock that he had to turn in order to sharpen his father's axe and also knives and swords, things. So he was working. And a stranger came up and said to the boy, you're doing very well. You, you put a beautiful edge on that knife. You're so strong. I've never seen a boy who could do this as well as you. And he was flattering him. And then the boy, uh, but then the stranger said, but of course you wouldn't be able to do my ax because it is very difficult. It has to be done just so. And the boy said, I can do it. Let me show you. So he took him and he just, he ground it very laboriously just to the guy's complete satisfaction, the boy wore himself out. And then the man said, well, good job, see you later, and left. He had an ax to grind, and that is why he gave the flattery. So we use this phrase uh, to describe people 
who want to get something, so they deceptively give you something else that you want. So that's what these people are, mercenary go-getters. Let's see, where am I? Or they may be docile educational employees who judge ideas by the status of their propounders. Um, docile means they won't think for themselves, they will only do what they are told. Educational employees reminds me a little bit of the story again in the Bible where uh, Jesus talks about the shepherds who are hirelings, they are employees. They don't love the sheep. They do it only for money. And then when the wolf comes, they flee away because they are employees and they don't love the sheep. When you think of teachers and people in education, there's not a lot of money. Usually people do it for love. They do it because it's in their heart. It's their vocation. So when he says, educational employees, I cannot help but think that he is using some sort of a negative suggestion, that they shouldn't be employees. If he didn't mean that, he would have said docile educators, educators. Educators is a more honorable term. So if you call someone an educator, you're giving them honor. If you call them an educational employee, you're saying they're probably not worth their wages. Okay, so docile educational employees who judge ideas by the status of their propounders. The person who puts forth an idea is propounding the idea. He is the person who thought of it. Okay, if, if a person propounds an idea, you should be able to listen to the idea, think it through, maybe pray about it, compare it to other ideas of philosophers or of great thinkers, and come to a conclusion of your own. However, if you judge ideas only by the status of the person who said it, oh, Obama said it, it must be right, then you are not thinking. So he is saying educational employees who judge the ideas by the status of their propounders. So if today um, someone uh, who is in, in favor says something, and then tomorrow that person is blacklisted, kicked out, and not in favor anymore, well, whatever they said must be wrong because their status is the deciding characteristic not the idea itself. So again, we have a picture of people who don't think for themselves. Or, the woolly-minded lost souls yearning for gurus. Um, woolly-minded makes you think of sheep. Uh, sheep have wool. Also, sheep are not smart. Sheep are fuzzy. They can't really learn. They're not smart. So if someone is woolly-minded, they are a sheep. They want to follow. They don't think for themselves. All of these are about not thinking. Anyway, woolly-minded lost souls. So they're not only sheep. They're sheep who have lost the flock. They're wandering around buying looking for someone to lead them, looking for a guru. A guru is a person who has all the answers. So, woolly-minded sheep, lost souls, yearning,
desiring, hoping for someone to lead them. They don't want clear thought of their own. They don't want instruction. They don't want to grow. They don't want to make a contribution to the thought of mankind. They just long to be led by a guru, any guru. Okay, now, that was a long list of people, but I can't even remember who these people are. So let's reread the beginning of the sentence. Okay. Oh, yeah, right. I think these are the people that man the walls of pseudoscience. Remember, we originally talked about how the guy, uh, Andresky, does not think that his book, his blast of a trumpet, will bring down the walls of pseudoscience. Because these walls are manned by too many stout defenders. And who are these stout defenders? They are the people we just talked about. The ones who don't think. They only obey. They follow gurus. They, um, they're, not, they're not scientists. Yet, they're defending the walls of pseudoscience in the social sciences. Okay, so we have the first sentence uh, down. So we'll continue after the word guru. Nevertheless, despite the advanced stage of cretinization, which our civilization has reached under the impact of the mass media, there are still people about who like to use their brains without the lure of material gain. And it is for them that this book is intended. Nevertheless, the word nevertheless means something different is coming. In spite of the direction I just spoke of, nevertheless, something different is coming. Okay? Nevertheless, despite the advanced stage of cretinization which our civilization has reached. Um, again, when it says despite, in spite of, despite, they mean the same thing. Kind of a hard phrase to explain if you don't already know what it means. Despite or in spite of Both of those mean the same thing. Uh, it means I am about to tell you something which will lead you to one conclusion, but the true conclusion is the opposite. So they give you a signal in advance that even though I am saying something which leads you to think I am going to conclude something specific, yet I will conclude the opposite. So this is a marker getting you ready to understand that what I'm saying does not determine the conclusion. Okay, so what is he going to say? All right, let's see. Nevertheless, despite the advanced stage of cretinization which our civilization has reached under the impact of mass media. Okay. Despite the advanced stage of cretinization. Advanced stage sounds like he's talking about a disease. We speak of someone in advanced stages of cancer. They're about to die. Or advanced stages of Alzheimer's. They can't remember their own name. Advanced stage renal failure. Their kidneys are shot. Advanced stage usually comes from a disease. But it's not a disease, literally, he's speaking of. He's speaking of the process of cretinization of our culture. Cretin. A cretin is a stupid person. 
When I was a child in school, the worst thing anyone could call you was a cretin. If they called you a cretin, that was the most insulting thing that we were ever called on the schoolyard. It means stupid and boorish, unmannerly, awkward, ugly. It's like troll. You know, it's like being a troll. Cretin. Um, in fact, when I looked it up online, it gave me a, a option to click for an image of a cretin. I thought, hmm, that should be interesting. So I clicked, and it was a person who obviously had some kind of a syndrome maybe Down syndrome or something, but they had a huge bald head and dull vacant eyes and a mouth that was open. It was like, only with a huge head, bald. And I thought it was a favorable picture because cretins are usually uglier than that. So, but it was a real person. So the cretinization of our culture means it is causing the people in our culture to become increasingly like cretins. There is a movie I saw recently called Idiocracy. I'll write that down. Idiocracy. I think it's that. This is a movie that I saw recently that is set um, 500 years in the future when the cretinization of our culture by the influence of mass media is so complete that everybody is mentally retarded. I think I liked that movie because I think it's, hopefully not true, but it makes a point. It makes the point that Levis is making, okay? So, where are we? Nevertheless, despite the advanced stage of cretinization, which our civilization has reached, so we're at end stages, in 1975, I don't think so. Actually, it's getting worse. We are not yet at end stage cretinization. But anyway, so he says, so despite the advanced stage of cretinization, which our civilization has reached under the impact of the mass media, you all know what mass media is, radio, television, movies, DVDs, CDs, um, internet, uh, mass media, and floods and floods of periodicals, newspapers, magazines, billboards, advertisements, all that. Okay, despite the advance, what he's saying is the mass media is making us stupid as a civilization. Despite that, despite that, that would make you think that there's no hope. But despite that, there are still people who like to use their brains without the lure of material gain. Use their brains, think, obviously, without the lure of material gain. Lure means the draw. If we put out something, if we're fishing, we're going to go fishing, we use a lure, uh, maybe a, a fly or a worm, and it draws the fish because he is hungry and he wants it. Lure is something that, it can be a verb to lure someone, or it can be a noun. A lure is bait that draws in someone. So despite the lure of material gain, i.e. money and power. So he's saying 
despite the advanced stage cretinization of our culture, there are still people who like to think freely without being paid, uh, like these earlier mercenary go-getters who are doing it only for money. All right? So he says there are some people, uh, and that, and it is for them that this book is intended. So he is writing for the minority, the few people in our poor cretinized culture who still like to think. By the way, I bought his book. I got the last copy on Amazon. The next copy is $200 American. So I guess you can't get it. Anyway, I thought it looked like a good book. Okay, so, so that book is intended for people like us who like to think. But if they are in a minority, then how can truth prevail? Okay, so if the people who are free thinkers are in a minority and there are a majority of cretinized, woolly-minded sheep, how can truth prevail? Remember, prevail means to conquer. Prevail means to rise to the top and shine forth. For truth to prevail, it cannot be quenched or smothered. It must win the battle. How can truth prevail if there are only a few clear thinkers and a majority are not thinking? That's the question. The answer, which gives some ground for hope. Um, ground is what we stand upon. Hope is when we expect something good to come. And if we can stand firmly expecting something good, that's ground for hope. In other words, it gives us a reason for hoping. Um, this, which he is about to say, the answer, makes it reasonable for us to hope. That's what gives grounds for hope means. Makes it reasonable to hope. Okay, so the question is, if thinkers are a minority, how can truth prevail? The answer, which gives grounds for hope, is that people interested in ideas and prepared to think them through and express them, regardless of personal disadvantage, have always been few. And if knowledge could not advance without a majority on the right side, there would never have been any progress at all. Let's stop there. Um, don't want to go too far. Um, the answer, which gives some ground for hope, is that people interested in ideas have always been few. So it is a characteristic of human nature to be woolly-minded. Most people are woolly-minded. Creative, independent thinkers are always in the minority. I believe that, by the way. Creative, independent, and I will add the word original, original, although I'm going to put that in parentheses, thinkers. have always been a minority. Um, creative. They come up with new ideas from within themselves or out of the ether, out of the muse. They originate ideas. Um, independent means they will think what seems right to them even if the majority is screaming something different.
they will not base their true perspective on what the majority is saying. They will think independently. If they agree with the majority independently, okay, they agree. But if they don't agree, it doesn't matter what the majority says. They are independent. Original. Original is another way of saying creative. They come up with something new that hasn't been expressed in that way before. Now, I personally, this is me, not Levis, my own personal opinion. I think that to be this way is a gift. Uh, it's a talent. Um, I think, I think, you know, suppose you have musical talent. You can play the piano. If you can play the piano at all, you have some talent. If you can play pretty good, you have maybe more talent. If you can play very well, maybe you're very talented. And then there's people like Beethoven who originated music or Mozart, the magic flute, who was thought to be the pen of God because of his music that flowed from him. Mozart didn't have to labor. He only had to transcribe. He heard everything in his head. So what I'm saying is talent is on a spectrum from a little, from no talent at all to a little talent, more, 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 until very, very talented, till you're a genius, okay? Savant. I think that the ability to think in this way is, is like that. Now, if you have some talent and then you train it by getting music lessons, by practice, by listening to great music and analyzing it, cut it apart, put it back together, by attempting to compose, submitting your work to others for criticism, revising. If you do all that, you could take this much talent and make it this much. Maybe you'll never become Mozart, but you'll become much better than if you just didn't practice and didn't study. You could be a person who has talent and never developed it. So what I'm saying is, I think the ability to think independently is a talent, and not everyone has it. I think it is pretty rare. I feel sure that you have it, because you wouldn't be listening to Olavo if you didn't. Personally, I believe that the people who listen to Olavo are the ones who, who are thinkers, who are independent thinkers. Hopefully, some of you are original thinkers, creative original thinkers, because if you are, you will carry on the, <clears throat> the work after Olavo is gone. That's the hope. But I would think those who are creative and original, even in your number, are probably few. But you are, all of you, are few compared to the thousands of people who aren't interested in this kind of class, this kind of study. So the fact that you are listening now means you are one of the few who have talent, but you must develop it. You must think. Try to think originally. Try to think independently. Study to show yourself approved. Study. Study literature. Study the Bible. Study history. Study current events. Become informed and wise. Study. Learn language so that you can develop your talent and use it for the glory of God. So that's my advice. Now back to the book. Let's see what we're doing here.
Okay. So if these people are in a minority and you are in a minority, you know that. How can truth prevail? The good news is the answer which gives grounds for hope is that people interested in ideas and prepared to think them through. Now to think something through means to not only receive the idea and say, yeah, but to go on and say, well, maybe not. Let me think. Let me write down some notes. Let me compare. Is this the same or different than what Aristotle said, or then what Descartes said, or Kant, is this the same or different? Um, is it the same as what Olavo says? Is it the same as what the Bible says? Is it the same as what Jesus said? You must think it through. What are the implications of this thought? How will it affect my life if I adopt these thoughts? How will it affect society and civilization if everybody adopted this thought? What would be the result? This is thinking it through all the way to the end. Think it through. Okay. So, people who are interested in ideas and prepared, are you prepared? You prepare by study. Got to be prepared. Prepared to think them through and express them regardless of personal disadvantage. Do you know Olavo is living here because he expressed his ideas and it was not welcome in the environment. If you begin to express your ideas, and they are not popular ideas, they are not what the majority think, then maybe someone will throw a rock through your window or slash the tires of your car. Or maybe they will write bad things about you in the news. So people who are prepared, in other words, by study, diligent study, prepared to think ideas through and express these ideas without respect to the results, to personal gain or personal disadvantage. These people have always been few. Think about Socrates. How many Socrateses have there been in history? Not many. And when he was on earth, they killed him. So you don't live long sometimes if you are one of these few. Okay, so these people have always been few. And if knowledge could not advance without a majority on the right side, there would never have been any progress at all. Think about history. If knowledge can only progress if a majority of the people agree, well, forget it. Because knowledge is always ahead. And the people are behind, like sheep, woolly-minded, uh, lost souls looking for gurus. Knowledge is ahead of its time. And then it teaches, and the people catch up. But by then, the knowledge has taken another two or three steps forward. So, if the majority had to agree in order for knowledge to advance, knowledge would never advance. So, it is not bad news that the people who are interested in ideas, original thinkers, are in a minority. There are few. That's not a problem. That's human nature. It has always been that way. So, okay, if you had to have a majority on the right side, there would never have been progress at all because it is always easier to get into the limelight. Limelight is in the public eye. 
It is always easy to get publicity, to be well known, to become famous. To be in the limelight means to have all attention on you and you are now famous. Okay, so it's easier to get into that situation and to make money, so it's more remunerative, uh, rather than being a pure original thinker like Olavo, for example, um, rather than being or Socrates or someone like that, rather than that, it's better to be a charlatan. Charlatanry. Charlatanry is fraud. Fraud. Charlatanry is fraud. Fraud is um, cheat, a cheat, a liar, a person who tries to sell you medicine that he knows will not cure you, um, a person who offers you uh, something which is bad and says it's good, sells it to you. A charlatan is a fraud a fake. Okay, so it's easier to get into the limelight by fraud and charlatanry, by lying, or by doctrinarism. Doctrinarism. Um, doctrinarism is um, if you have an idea which is good theoretically, but it doesn't work in practice, and you hold to that idea, you are being doctrinaire. Uh, for example, those who put forth communism these days are doctrinaire because communism has been proven not to work as an economic system. And so it is only good theoretically, and it's not even that good theoretically. But as a matter of practice, it does not work. Um, some of the philosophical systems Olavo told me about are doctrinaire, uh, but we won't go into that because I can't remember which ones they were. But anyway, doctrinaire means inflexible, and theoretical but not practical. So putting forth ideas that don't work and that you know don't work, but still teaching them inflexibly. Psychofancy. Psychofancy is to um, be a person who flatters, who tells, it's like the guy who had an ax to grind. Um, only not exactly. Let's see. Psychofancy. It's flattery. Flattery. That's when I tell you you're wonderful, you're handsome, you're strong, you're delicious, you're terrific. I want you. But really, I want what you can do for me. I don't love you. I, I just want you to promote me. Make me your CEO. Pay me money, you know. So I am, a, I am your psychophant if I am constantly flattering you. Another word we have for it is toady. Like a, a frog, toad, toady. This is a person who... Uh, deceptively flatters and tells you how good you are just to get gain. So psychofancy, and it has to do with attaching, attaching yourself uh, to hang on to this person and flatter them so that they'll constantly be um, helping you. Okay, and soothing or stirring oratory. Oratory is giving speeches. 
If you're soothing, you just tell people, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And if it's stirring, you say, follow me, we can do this. It, we will conquer, we will change the world. Either one gets followers. And it's easy. It's easier than coming forth with original thought and wisdom that will bring knowledge a few steps forward for humanity. So all of these um, things are in opposition to uh, logical and fearless thinking. So <clears throat> that's the end of the sentence. I'm going to read the whole sentence one more time. The answer of the question is, if logical thinkers are in a minority, how can truth prevail? Uh, the answer is that people interested in ideas and prepared to think them through and express them, regardless of personal disadvantage, have always been few. And if knowledge could not advance without a majority on the right side, there would never have been any progress at all because it is always easier to get into the limelight. So now we're talking about the majority of people will get into the limelight and make money by, by charlatanry, which is fraud, doctrinarism, ideas that don't work in practice, and psychofancy, toadying idle flattery, and also soothing or stirring oratory. So the majority do those things in order to ga get gain. Uh, and people who engage in logical and fearless thinking can't get into the limelight. It's very difficult to get attention worldwide by logical, fearless thinking. Not impossible, but it's easier the other way. So that's why we have more charlatans on TV than we have um, people like Socrates. The charlatans get higher ratings. So... No, he says, continuing on, the reason why human understanding has been able to advance in the past and may do so in the future is that true insights are cumulative and retain their value regardless of what happens to their discoverers. Anyway, let us not despair. This sounds a lot like the living principle, the idea that insight is cumulative it's like we said about the tree growing up, always adding more and more and more as it searches for the sky. Uh, the fact that knowledge is cumulative from creation till now. Every generation adding its insights to an, you know, an ever-growing body of wisdom. Now, he's not speaking so broadly. He's talking about the social sciences. He's talking about anthropology and sociology and psychology, um, knowledge which is gained in those kinds of fields is cumulative and retains its value without respect to what happens to uh, the person who discovered it. So for example, if the works of Sigmund Freud are valuable, then even if someone smears Sigmund Freud uh, in his reputation, yet the ideas are out there. And they, are, they retain their value uh, without respect to who originally said them, at least for independent thinkers. So he says the reason knowledge can continue moving forward is because the ideas hold their value and stand on their own, on their merits, without respect to the people who first put them forth. So we should not despair. Okay, we're going to take a break. Do you have any questions? Last week, someone sent a question one minute after we stopped. So if you have a question, shoot it off to us now. We'll wait five minutes or so, and if there are questions, I'll come back. And if not, I'll see you next week. We have some questions, so we'll have a few more moments before we stop. Hold on one sec. We're getting the questions off the uh, Internet.
Um, while I'm waiting for the questions off the internet, I wanted to tell you what we were speaking of during the break. I was talking to Alessandro, who is our technical guy, and um, we were talking about the fact that since I have been reading this book, I have started to read everything, more of the classics. I've been very interested in everything literary that I could get my hands on. And I find my mind making connections everywhere. And Alessandro said that this is a part of uh, Olavo's hope for his students, that if you have a lot to read, pretty soon you will begin to make your own connections and build your own um, philosophy and your own uh, plan of action for the good in the world. And I said, and I, this is what I believe, this is from my experience as a homeschooler. I think that when a person is young, for example, everything up until maybe in your 20s, 25 years old maybe, and less. It is not easy to make connections, but it is easy to learn. It is easy to receive impressions that become a part of you. And I think that if you have children or if you yourself are young, what you should do is read everything, especially great literature, including ancient mythology, the stories of the Old Testament and the Bible, um, great works of literature and fiction, um, and as you read these books, try to love these books. Try to live these books. I'm saying love the books and live the books. Um, what I mean by that is experience what the characters in the book are experiencing. Put yourself in their situation. This will cause you to grow and expand. And it will build into you the raw material to make connections and be wise later. People are like fruit trees, apple tree, orange tree, you plant the tree and it takes many years for it to grow to the point where it will begin to bear fruit. It might take 10 or 12 years for a tree to begin to put forth flowers and then fruit. And people are the same way. While they are young, they are building the database. And then when they are older, maybe in your 30s and up, you begin to use the database to pull knowledge from here and here and here and put it all together and process it and then put it out in a new form. So if you are young, I advise you to read and enjoy the large, enormous, significant stories of the literary history. And then if you're older, we can bring in the experiences of literary characters to shed light on what's happening in real life today. So that's what we were talking about in the break. Uh, do you have something over there? Yeah, I have a question. Question. Um, Margarita, you said several times 
that this text we are reading is very difficult. Why is that so? What's the reason of it? Is it Livy's style or the fact that we already that we are already the products of that advanced stage of communication <laughs> which our civilization advanced uh, has reached under the impact of the mass media? Um, the question is, I have said many times that this text is very difficult. Why is that? What is the reason? Is it because of Levis's style or because we are the products already of the advanced stages of cretinization which have resulted from the impact of the mass media? Well, I am sorry to say I, I'm really not sure why it is so hard. I know that Alessandro, um, who is a graduate of St. John's, which is a very difficult college, um, also had trouble with this book. Um, I think it's Levis's style. Um, I don't think it's that we are the pro, uh, pro, w that we're the result of the product of the cretinization. I don't think so. I think that Levis writes in a way that is very complex. And Levis does not, well, a clear sentence has a skeleton. And then you can insert things at predictable places. For example, I could say, the cat ran. Okay, I could say the cat ran. Simple sentence. Now if I want to add to it, if I want to describe the cat, I would put it here. The um, bedraggled, frightened cat ran. So the the scared cat, scared cat ran. If I wanted to describe how he ran, I would put it after the ran, after the verb. The scared cat ran um, hurriedly away from the mouse. So, hurriedly. And if I wanted to put in some uh, extra, like some extra thought about the cat, maybe I would say, the scared cat who I love ran hurriedly away from the mouse. So there is a specific place to put something in the structure of a sentence. Levis doesn't seem to follow that. He would say, the cat, scared and terrified as he was, but who I loved, away from the mouse, ran hurriedly. I mean, he'll just, he, he mixes up his ideas and throws in extra things without um, reference to predictable positions in the sentence. So you have to almost cut the sentence apart, take things out, and find the skeleton. And once you find the skeleton, you can then figure out where everything goes. But this has to be done. You can't just read, read it through and understand because you have to take it apart. So I don't think we are the products um, of the cretinization. Uh, 
I don't think that's the problem. Although I'm sure we are, we are the products to a certain extent. And we don't even know how much. It's, it's very bad. I see my children watching terrible things on the internet. We don't have a television, but they find them on, on the internet. And I think, how can they want to watch this? They are the products of our civilization. So, are there any other questions? Okay, I think that's it for now. If you have any questions about anything, send them in. We'll talk 